Good morning, good morning. You are looking live at the sanctuary of the Churchtown Church of God. A pastor with a relatively weak voice this morning after a long day of preaching and teaching. Facing a fairly long week of preaching and teaching. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. This is my office. I don't know what your office looks like. But this is my office, and it is amazing and wonderful and fantastic, and I enjoy and love. I mean, I always say, there she is, the Pastor Susie. You see her walking. Monday mornings are Pastor Susie's favorite. Now listen to me, because the week is so busy, we've already done the trash. Right? Susie, come here. We've already done the trash because Susie likes to dig in the trash on Monday mornings. And we had a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of goodies. You know, if you don't, if you don't come to the Churchtown Church of God for any other reason, you should come for the goodies. Good heavens, we have goodies. We came for a prayer service yesterday. Like, we, we, we took our little break and we came back for our prayer service. And everybody was like, an oh, you can eat buffet. Everybody's just sitting there eating. It was awesome. But we had, because we had a good morning. Wow. See, any day where you get to see my, this mug, Dennis, is a good day. I can't stay for too long today. I've got business to attend to and some fun to attend to. That's right. I've carved out a few hours of fun with my daughter, my first daughter, my only daughter. We're going to go have some fun today as well. I know, imagine that. There's so much to do. People to see. Obligations to attend to. All of those different things. But uh, I want to spend some time with Olivia. I know that other people are important. But there is an old pastor saying, if you're a pastor and you have failed your family, you've already failed as a pastor. So, whether they are 12 years old or 25 years old, I am going to attend to my family and carve out that time. And uh, we teach from the inside out here at Churchtown, and I hope that you do as your church as well. We teach that there are as many associate pastors in this church as there are followers of Jesus Christ. We talk about how you, as a follower of Christ, are responsible for your spiritual health and the spiritual health of, health of whomever may be called in your path. Now, that's not to say, hey, hands off. No, not at all. Mm -mm. We talked last week about pastoral care and the importance of that. But part of that pastoral care is this, that teaching the growth that is necessary to attend to your own spiritual needs. Can uh, the, the spiritual leader of a home, can they administer, so to speak, I don't know what word, can they administer the Lord's Supper in their own home? Yes. Oftentimes when we baptize in the church, there will be the leader of the home there with me baptizing. It's important that we understand because again, we talk about particularly because our experience is the American church. We do this all the time. Like this is delegated to you. This is delegated to you. Music is this group of people. Uh, you know, the, the worship leading is this group of people. The teaching is this person or this group of people. Like it's all delegated. And the, those in the pews, those in the pews are consumers of spiritual services. And that is the farthest thing from Christianity that there can be. The farthest thing. If that is a church, 
and that is the the underlying whether it is intentional or not that is not only unbiblical it is straight from hell because it is the opposite you have created yourself a cult of personality a cult of worship a cult of church and the expectation is you come and you sit in the pews and you pay your money and you get what we give you. And then you can walk away. That is the farthest thing from actually following Jesus that there is. I don't care how you couch it. You can couch it with fancy this, fancy that. You can couch it in all these amazing sermon series. But is the underlying ecclesiology one of this, the fact that the church is the provider of spiritual services. And again, there is no real set fee, although many set the fee at 10% of your income. And again, we would argue till the cows come home about tithing. I don't believe that tithing, I believe that, I, but anyway, why I, I just can't understand why I would want to, anyway. We don't need to get into tithing, but it's not a thing for me. It's not an uh, ecclesiastical or a, a theological uh, assumption of mine or belief that I hold, tenant that I hold. But that's still, even if you do limit them to 10%, that's still a significant fee to receive your spiritual goods and services. If that's your underlying ecclesiology, hmm, so we had a busy weekend. Can you imagine that? A busy weekend around here. Hey, Beth. Hello, everybody. Susie's here on my lap. She's kicking her legs. She's ready to go. And I can't stay for very long. I just wanted to touch base and let you know that it was a busy weekend. It was an amazing weekend. I got to preach last night. Yes, I am. Absolutely, I am. I don't know if there's much to clarify. I think we're told to do this as often as we participate in remembrance of him. What does that mean? As often as we drink of the cup and we partake of the bread, we could, we could, we could speak of, we could, so to speak, administer, we could um, participate in the ritual of the Lord's Supper before every meal or after every meal or after a meal a day or after a meal a week. Maybe it's every Friday night and it's dinner or it's Sunday night and it's dinner and you have your meal and after the meal, the spiritual leader of the home. We speak of Christ, we pray to Christ, we remember Christ, we remember his body, we remember his blood and we participate as we are taught in scripture. If we truly believe that the elements are not a sacra sacramental if we truly believe that you do not need an intercessor, if you truly believe that you do not need an earthly intercessor like Mary or a priest or anybody else, then theologically, you do not need a pastor. Theologically, you need to be sound in understanding what you are doing, and that is my point. That is the job of the church, to raise up people who understand what they're doing and why they're doing it as followers of Jesus Christ, people who are deep in the word, people who grow and sharpen one another and become the sons and daughters that the Lord sees for them. So no, it's not anything that is taken lightly. It's not anything that is just thrown out there. But it is something. 
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Turning on the Lights. Like I said, we are talking about a discussion of the underlying ecclesiology of a church. Well, well, that's all theological. That's how great. Ecclesiology is just how you do church. We talked about uh, a couple of other theological type terms yesterday. We talked about how scripture informs scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. This is another pet peeve of mine. I don't know if we license or, license or ordain people just to do that. That would not be, I mean, like theologically, you know, we understand the ordinances and we make that very clear, but how does, why do you need licensed or ordained to be able to do that in your own home? So let's be very clear of the context as well, in your own home. If we say, well, everything in the Bible is, uh, is open to me, open and available to me as a follower of Christ, except these things for which I need an intercessor. This, you are designed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You are designed to be and to exemplify his image and likeness. You are designed to be and allow God's Holy Spirit to flow through you. If you, if I can read this and understand how significant the Lord's Supper is, a follower of Christ can read this and understand how significant the Lord's Supper is. So if we're like, hey, you know, we're all, the only, that, why, if we're gonna license and or, ordain ministers just for, like, we get this all the time. Well, I got a guy in my church that wants to perform a marriage. So can he get a license so he can do that legally? What? Are you kidding us? And the same would be, you know, be true. Like, well, I want to perform the Lord's Supper because I need a license. There's so much more. And I'm not talking about doing it for a church, Dennis. I'm talking about doing it for your children, for your wife and your children, or your husband and your children. I don't think that you have to turn to a license. Well, you've got a license. You are ordained. You are my intercessor on behalf of me to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't read that. Yeah, I mean, that the point that I am making is raising up. When we talk about right, right, right now in the in the denomination, the whole thing is we're going to mass produce leaders. I don't even know what that means, mass produce leaders. We need to educate. We need to help people. We, you know, we need to license and ordain those who are called to ministry mass produce leaders i don't that i don't even but within the context of that local church i'm saying that we take the time so that if you are a man or a woman in the head of your household and you are a follower of jesus christ that you understand what it means to live as a follower of Jesus Christ and to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to lead your household for which we are responsible for. So that thank, actually, thank you for clarifying that. Because that is the context of which I'm speaking as a leader in your own home, the spiritual leader. You should take that education very seriously and that responsibility very seriously. So here we are this morning, like I said, we, we taught yesterday on Scripture interpreting Scripture, and I used the simple example of a Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. I don't know if people understood like where I was going to go with all of that, because if you read the openings of Proverbs, uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, we went up to chapter 8, I believe, and you hear about wisdom and wisdom speaking for itself, it is uh, personified. It is presented as this creation of God, this facet of God that has been with God since the beginning and has been available to God's creation since the advent of Jesus Christ. So that's what Proverbs, right? And they're like, oh, wow, okay, this is available. And then you turn to Ecclesiastes, and there are sections of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1, chapter 2, especially that say the exact opposite. Solomon is speaking, and he is saying, I have tried wisdom, and it doesn't work. I have tried to, 
to compare this, that, and the other thing. I've done this all. I've, I've compared wisdom with madness, with folly, with fun, and it's all just the same. We all just grow up, grow old, and die like the animals. And my, when we presented that, I said, okay, here it is, everybody. This is, these, this is our holy word. How do we reconcile? And the, the point where we went is that if we want to grasp this understanding of how the Lord is presenting wisdom to us, then we open up the scriptures and we operate under this principle that scripture interprets scripture, that there is biblical theology in meaning that a, a concept, an idea, a teaching of God's, a teaching of God's is developed through the scriptures. And so we see wisdom being presented in Proverbs by God, personified. I am wisdom. Here I am. This is who I am. This is how long I have been around. These are the purposes that I serve. I am this facet of God's. And then we see, that's sort of the top down, right? And then we see Ecclesiastes, which I said was kind of the bottom up. Solomon's interpretation of that as a broken human being says, oh yeah, yeah, I got all of that proverb stuff. I tried it, it didn't work, it sucks. That's us. It didn't serve me the way I wanted it to serve me. So I'm off that wisdom train, you see? And then we broadened that discussion a little bit to, okay, well, how do we, I mean, isn't that us? We, you know, the, the, this is about God after all, not about us. And so he says, here I am, here I am. This is who I am, I, you know? And we say, okay, I'll take this, I'll take that, I'll take this. And even when we do, we'll say, well, I tried this whole God thing. God didn't serve my purposes the way I wanted him to, right? Because Proverbs is God, 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 God. Ecclesiastes is I, 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 I. And so that's where we went to it. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Mary. <clears throat> There's a theological point. Like I said, we talked about biblical theology. We, um, it's very important that we do this. And again, when I, whether I'm, we're talking to quote unquote lay persons or clergy, because don't we clergy fall into the trap of not wanting to examine the depth and the breadth of Scripture? We just want to take Jeremiah 29 11 and preach it. Yes, God has a plan for your life. And we see this idea of God's will for our lives. And if you just pluck it from Jeremiah 29, 11, you get a little snapshot of that. But there's so much about it in all of Scripture. You can hear my voice. I preached yesterday at Jen's funeral. It was awesome. Celebration of life slash funeral. I think she was happy. Like I said, I made the mistake of asking her. I said, so, you know, we talked about all of the scriptures and all of the scriptures that were there at her funeral were chosen by her. And I would just ask the people to close their eyes and think of her as we read this scripture. And I think that as she, her life testified to the scriptures that she chose, it was just so amazing. And then the scriptures that we had chosen for me to preach on. And I, 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 I told the story because I made the mistake. I was like, and I shared this in church yesterday. I said, Jen, what, what would you like me to preach on? She just looked at me like I was dumb and said, Jesus. I said, of course, I'm sorry. <laughs> so it was good for her because that is probably one of my only discernible skills is preaching on Jesus. And so I, I think she was would have been, I think she was pleased. We read that scripture from John eleven. You know, John eleven in the raising of Lazarus, and I just was stuck on the idea that when Jesus turns to his disciples and says 
Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. It is so because, so that the Son of God can be glorified and the Father glorified through him. And if there's one thing I knew about Jennifer Grove, it's that she knew from the moment she was diagnosed that her sickness would not end in death. She is alive. And she lived her life, and she lived her life these last six years with cancer to glorify God through it, period. Powerful stuff. It was amazing and wonderful and fantastic. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. And that's where we went. And that's how she lived. So yeah, we were all over the place yesterday here. This, this pastor was preaching all over the place. And I just... Uh, you know, we're entering into the Bible reading project tomorrow night at 7 as people gather to read the Gospel of John. And I thought that it was appropriate that we took a look at what I was talking about, this idea of biblical theology, this idea of Scripture, interpreting Scripture, so that we can break our mindsets of this sort of proof text preaching which is a shallow, easy road and open up the scriptures for our congregations. <clears throat> I'm not even sure if we do that for one of the biggest things like the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You want to talk about the concepts of biblical theology and you can go through <clears throat> Galatians, you can go through Ephesians, you can go through Romans. Paul, it's it's... The crux of Paul's teaching is that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant, and thus ushering in the New Covenant. And Paul was also very, you know, focused on going, he would start in the synagogues because he wanted to make sure that people understood that this is, I like that, I like that saying. Thank you, Dennis. I'm going to steal that. Right? Do we even, do, if, if, if any member of your congregation, if you said, hey, talk to me about how Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Right? That, that's not seminary degree stuff. That's word of God stuff. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophecy. He is the Messiah that was foretold in every chapter of the Old Testament. He is the, who usher, the ushering in of the new covenant. Where your sins have been atoned for. And faith in Jesus Christ and the atoning work on the cross is enough. Right? Dennis talked about, you know, how, you know, there's so much more. And one of the things that we learn in seminary is the depth and the breadth of Scripture, I hope. And we are, I don't even know if we're given or taught in seminary. I know it's not a great focus in seminary of preaching the Word. Can you preach it and teach it? That is one of the primary roles of pastoral care. You say, what? That's just preaching. Preaching is pastoral care. Because it is spiritual care. And it is the crux of the skills that we possess. If you are not a preacher and that gift, there are, there are other pastoral paths and vocational paths through vo in vocational ministry that you can participate in. Even as associate pastors, official titled associate pastors of individual of churches, whether it be with individual groups or worship or youth or administration, executive pastoring, 
running the church. But gee willikers, if you are called to pastor, especially in a single solo environment like this, you're called to preach, brother, sister. If you can't, if, you, if, the, if the folks if you can't do that, that's a problem. So. So yesterday it was Ecclesiastes 1. And it was John 11. What a day. What a day. What a day. We talked in John 11. There's this great, there's this great moment. <clears throat> Jesus told Martha, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. You guys know what's coming. If you, I mean, this chapter. I mean, Jesus told her, John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. And that's where we left it. You know, as Jennifer chose those scriptures, she chose them, this particular scripture, for two reasons. The first was the passage that I read at the beginning and how we are called to live our lives regardless of our circumstances for the glory of God. And she did. And then the last was this message that she had for her family, for her extended family, for all brothers and sisters who loved her. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. He is the Messiah, the one sent from God. And let me ask you the same question that Jennifer asked everybody that she ever met. Do you believe this? The answer has eternal consequences. So why don't we pray? Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning. Thank you for your word that you have brought forward. Lord, we pray for your church. We pray that your word is opened and that your disciples go deep into your word, understanding and living the word of God as you call us forth to do so. Let your church be your body, Lord. Let your church be your bride, Lord. Let us be submitted to you and your will as your church. Lord, in each and every individual that's coming across this video today, Lord, we pray that each and every individual is submitted to you by the mighty power of your Holy Spirit made possible by the life and the death and the resurrection of the Christ, Jesus. Lord, we believe. We believe with our whole hearts and we give our lives to you. Amen. God bless you guys. May God keep you. We should be able to check in tomorrow, if only for a little while. Uh, thank you for all of your love and your support and your prayers. And have fantastic, incredible, awesome, wonderful, fantastic Mondays. Peace.